I want you to uh, join me opening your Bibles if you have them or your device, whatever you use. And I'm going to begin by reading one verse and it's in 1 John. Now this is a topical message, so we're going to go through a lot of scriptures today. And uh, you might want to take notes. Hopefully you got your notes as you made your way in. But we're going to begin with this one verse. And we're talking about the amazing love of God. And I love the way this verse begins. It simply says, this is love. And then it tells us what it is. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, here we are together on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, where we celebrate the miraculous, the most miraculous event in all of history that leads to the hope of all eternity. And we're so grateful today that we can come and acknowledge our worship to you, our rejoicing in you, our thankfulness to you. And so, Lord, as we get into your word this morning, I pray that your word would speak to our hearts as every individual heart uh, needs, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you could just visit each person here and speak directly to them in a way that it just impacts their lives and touches their hearts. So, Father, we thank you now for all that you're going to teach us all through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to look at the reality of God's love for just a moment. And I think about 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. It's called the love chapter of the Bible. Um, And I want to read you verses 4 through 7 where we can see what uh, the love of God is really like. What it's like. And I'm reading from the NLT for these verses here because I like the way that it... um, the way that it uh, puts it down on paper. It says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures throughout every circumstance. Now, certainly, we can understand why this passage is often read at weddings, right? But here's the thing is that that describes God's love. God's love is perfect and we can't really live up to all that right there because we're human and we're imperfect. But what better way to uh, strive for uh, love than to strive for the love of God as it's described here. God's love is a perfect model of how we should love one another. The fact is that those verses are an accurate description of God's love for you and for me. Can you imagine being loved like that or being able to be loved like that? It would change our lives. It would be so dramatic to us. And uh, yet this is certainly how God loves us. And everyone needs this type of love. We all do. But if you expect to experience that kind of love from another human being, you're always going to be disappointed because we just don't have that perfection within us. We need that type of love, but God is the only one who can love you and me perfectly. He's the only one. And when you have a relationship with God and you experience his love, then it empowers you to love other people the way that God loves you. God's love is a perfect model for how to love. To make this uh, reality of God's love more memorable, I want to use the word love today. And uh, I want to begin by the L, which would stand for level. And basically the truth here is that no other love can reach the level of God's love. And then with the O, we look at the word object. We are the objects of God's love. And then with the V, the word value. A love relationship with God is of great value. 
And finally, with the E, we look at evidence. The evidence of God's love is unquestionable. Now, let's begin by looking at the level of God's love. No other love can fill us to the level of God's love for us. Why? Because God's love is the greatest love. Listen to John 15, 13. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. And after he said that, he went to the cross and laid down his life, the greatest love. God's love is also a limitless love. In Ephesians 3.19, Paul prayed a prayer for us. And in that prayer, he said that we would know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now imagine that, a love so great that we can't even understand it. But yet it continually fills us to all the fullness of God. Listen, if you get a hold of God's love in your heart and in your life, and, and then tomorrow you feel empty inside, all you got to do is go to God and say, God, pour some more love in me today. Fill me up today to your fullness today. God's love is so limitless that as long as he's poured it in you, he never runs out. He always has all the love that each and every one of us needs. And God's love is an unconditional love. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's unconditional. God didn't say, hey, you need to go clean up your life and I'll love you. He didn't say, you need to get rid of those sins out of your heart and I'll love you. He didn't say, you've got to attend church and Bible study and, and you've got to give to the poor and you've got to go on a foreign mission trip and I'll love you. No, he said, while you were still a sinner lost in your sins, he loved you. Mm, his love is unconditional. Let me ask you a question. What is the level of your love for God? You know, one measurement, one great measurement, if we want to examine ourselves this morning and say, well, what is the level of my love for God? One great measurement is the measurement of time. The measurement of time. The time you give God speaks volumes about how much that he truly is important in your priorities of life. A love relationship is built on spending time together, talking with each other. I think about my wife Susan and I. We spend time together every day. We enjoy talking with each other every day. Our love grows every day. But what if all of a sudden I clammed up? What if all of a sudden I just wasn't there to spend that time with her? What would that do to our relationship? It would truly hinder it. It could even cause it to slowly die. But God wants an intimate relationship with us. He longs for that. You know, if you have a problem spending time with God, you need to question your love for him. I think about Psalms. I read this just yesterday morning, Psalms 46, 10. It says, be still and know that I'm God. And you know what the problem of that is? Is that Americans are doing people. We have a hard time sitting still. We're always on the move. We're always working at something. Often we allow our daily affairs to consume our every hour and to even take the place of us finding any time to spend along with God. And our relationship with the Lord su suffers. We say we love God by pointing to all the good things we do. But God, I did this for you. God, I did this for you. And, and God's like, I don't want what you do. I want you to be still. Be still. Spend time with me. Know that I'm God. I think about what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock it. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in to him and dine with him and he with me. And that's talking about an intimate relationship. Think about the intimacy, men, if you remember when you were courting your wife, back in the days when you would take her on dates, take her out to eat dinner. You, I hope you still do that. But you did that because you wanted to create an intimacy with her. You did that because you wanted to win her heart. And that's the only way to true intimacy. And we read this here that Jesus says, I'm knocking at the door and if you let me in, I want to dine with you. 
I want to have some time of intimacy with you. Oh, the level of our love for God. If only it could be a mere portion of his love for us. And then we see the object of God's love. And that's us. We're the objects of God's love. And here's why I say this. Because first of all, God chose us. Jesus also said in John 15, 16, he says, he's talking to his disciples. He said, you did not choose me. I chose you. I chose you. God not only chose us, but he prepares us. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, it says, God will circumcise your heart to love the Lord with all your heart. Now, that's some weird terminology there, right? Circumcise means the cutting away of the flesh. And he looks at our heart, and our heart is filled with all of our fleshly desires. And there's no room for that intimate relationship with the Lord. But what he says is, he he says, if you will allow me to come into your heart, I'll cut all that stuff away. I'll get rid of all those fleshly desires so that there's room for me in your heart. And that's why he said there that um, he he would circumcise your heart to love the Lord with all your heart. He doesn't want a little portion. He doesn't want a little corner in the closet. He wants all your heart to belong to him. Why wouldn't he? That's a great love that you could express to him. Give him your heart. So he prepares our hearts. He chooses us. Not only that, but he comes to us. We just read it just a moment ago. Revelation 3.20. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. In other words, we didn't go looking for him. He came to us. And he's knocking on our heart's door. And apparently he's not only knocking, but he's calling. Because he says, if anybody hear my voice and open the door, I'm going to come in. I'm knocking, I'm seeking you, I'm coming to you. I want to live in your heart. God also reveals himself to us in Romans 1.20. Now listen to this. It says, since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes are clearly seen. Many, nobody's seen God, right? We don't see God. He's not visible. He's invisible. But it says even though he's invisible to our human uh, perspective, our human eyes, that still he lets us know. His attributes are clearly seen. How are they clearly seen? Well, just look outside at nature, for one. Look up into the heavens at night. Just look around you. They're clearly seen. And it says that they're understood by the things that are made. What's the things that are made? Us. He created you and he created me in his image and after his likeness. And he says that his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power. In other words, some people say, well, I I guess there's a God. I guess there's a good God. But he's saying, no, you don't have to guess. You can, you know, I'm a powerful God. I'm an eternal God. And it says that he makes it so clear to us that we're without excuse to explain why we don't believe in him. That we're without excuse to explain why we won't let him live in our heart. We're without excuse. And one day you stand before this God, this powerful God, this eternal God in heaven. And he'll say, why did you reject me? And you know what? You will not have an excuse. You won't be able to say, well, Lord, I, I didn't know who you were. Oh, yes, you did. Because he even tells us that he writes his own commandments, his laws. On the tables of our heart, he puts them in there just like he did for Moses on the tablets. God reveals himself to us. That's a whole message in itself, but I've got to move on. And God works on us. In Philippians 2.13, it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Listen, when God has somebody that's saying, Lord, I'm willing to live for you. I want to do what you'd have me to do. He goes to work in you. He works in you to accomplish his will in your life. And he's been working in my life a long time. And I'm going to tell you something. I like his will in my life. It's a good life. It's a joy-filled life. It's a wonderful life. It's a blessed life. I am so glad that he works in me. And not only that, but God sacrificed for us. Now, 1 John 3.16, different from the John 3.16, but telling the same story, 1 John 3, 16, we know love because he laid down his life for us. 
he sacrificed for us. But you know what? Even though we're the objects of his love, we got a problem. We do not seek God's love. Romans 3, 10 and 11 says, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. You know why? Because we're natural born sinners. You know, as a natural born sinner, what you seek, you seek to satisfy the pleasures of that heart, that fleshly heart. You seek to satisfy your desires above everybody else. You're the center of your world. And, and as, a, as a natural born sinner, we're not seeking after God. We're seeking our ways. So what happens? What changes people's lives? Well, here's the good news. God's love seeks us. We're not seeking him, but he's seeking after us. Luke 19, 10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You say, what does that mean, lost? Well, it means this. It means that God created all of us special, created us in his image after his likeness. There's no two of us alike. He created us to have an intimate relationship, a love relationship with him. But because we're natural born sinners and that sin curse is handed down to us, then we start thinking about ourselves, our ways, our fleshly desires, and we get lost to the reality of who God is. And there's so many people walking through this world today that when you mention God, they go, yeah, I'm sure there's a God, but they're lost. They're lost to the understanding that there's a God in heaven, a mighty, powerful, eternal God that loves them like no other. They're lost to that truth. And so Jesus said there uh, that he came to seek and to save those that are lost. Lost. We're the object of his love. Consider a guy named Saul in the Bible. Uh, you may or may, may not know who he was. I'll give you a brief little um, story about who he was. He was a powerful Jewish man. He was a Pharisee. He was extremely educated. And he was going from town to town persecuting believers in Jesus Christ. And he thought he was doing God a big favor. He was lost to the true reality of who God was. And he was caught up in, in himself, in his strength, in his power, in what he thought he was doing for God. And then one day he's on a road to Damascus. And in the middle of the day, with him and his companions, a light shines from heaven and he gets struck down to his knees. And he gets blinded. And then all of a sudden, God got his attention. Now, really, I think it would be smart not to wait until God knocks us down to our knees. But some of us had to get there before we ever paid attention to him. But when you consider Saul and what he was doing, the damage he is doing to God's kingdom... And he wasn't seeking the true God. He wasn't seeking truth. He was living his truth. And then what we see is that even though he chose not to love God, God chose Saul. And he came to Saul. And he arrested his heart. And he saved him because why? Saul was the object of God's love, just like we're the object of God's love. Saul's life changed forever. As a matter of fact, he started going by Paul. His life changed forever. Instead of being the persecutor, he became the persecuted for the glory of God. God sought him out. And I just want to remind you again that you are the object of God's love. And he is seeking you to love him. Now let's look at the value of God's love. Most people look at God as being far away and unconcerned about their lives. They're like, yeah, there's a God in heaven, but I don't know anything about it. He's so far away. He's not, he's not concerned about me, but what God wants to have is a love relationship with you, and that love relationship he wants to have with you is of great personal value. And so when we look at the value of God's love, the first thing I want you to see is that God's love is a real value. When God came in the cool of the day to Adam and Eve to spend time with them, to have an intimate relationship with him, he was being real. 
when Jesus, in other words, God in the flesh, walked with his disciples, or when, when, when God was in the furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he was real in that furnace. He was tangible. They could touch him. When God stopped Abraham from sacrificing his only son on top of the mountain, he was real that day. He stopped him from sacrificing his only son. And God wants to be that real with you. Whatever circumstances that you're facing, whatever you're going through, whatever it is, whatever sacrifice you're having to make, God wants to be real. He wants to be right there with you in it. And not only is God's love real, God's love is a personal value. When God comforted Hagar when she was mistreated by Sarah, he was being very personal with her. When Jesus, when Jesus walked with the disciples as his time was here on earth, he was being very personal with them. He was being their friend. They were living together. They were walking together. They were serving together. It was a personal value to them that he was there. When Jesus knocks at your heart's door, he's inviting you into a personal relationship. God wants to be this personal with you. And we're talking about the value of God's love, and God's love is a practical value. When God sent an angel to free Peter from prison, he was just being practical. Why? Because Peter needed to be out preaching this new gospel that had arrived, and he couldn't do that from a jail cell. So he sends an angel in the middle of the night to fling open the doors of the jail cell, and he says, Peter, go back and keep on preaching, buddy. He was just being practical with Peter. When Jesus fed the 5,000 families in the desert, he was being practical. How could they listen to him share the gospel if their stomachs are growling? He was just being practical with them and feeding them, and then he shared uh, the truth of the gospel with them. When Jesus provided a coin in the fish's mouth to pay his taxes, he was being practical. Uh, I am working on my taxes right now. And I'm down to about, I got about 20% to go. It's a challenge every year. And I I was reading this, I thought, well, maybe I need to just go fishing. (laughs) I, I need to catch some fish with coins in their mouth. Either that or just say, Lord, you see this mess, help me. And I do, I pray. When I start my taxes, I pray. Lord, I, I can't afford a tax person. I gotta just, I just gotta gut this out and do it. But yeah, I I think I might go fishing this afternoon. (laughs) But you see, God is so practical. Whatever you need, listen, God's love is a valuable love. It's a love for today. It's a love for your walk day in and day out. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, however you're suffering, whatever you need, God's love is a valuable love. Listen to Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. It says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Can I just give a witness that that's true? Because before I was seeking God, before I was seeking his righteousness, there was a lot of things that were being, it felt like they were being taken away from me. Think about that prodigal son. He left his daddy's house with a pocket full of money and before long he found himself wanting to eat the food that they were giving to the pigs. But then when he come home to the father, then the father lavished him with love and all kind of goodies. Didn't he? I'm telling you that that he wants to take care of us all things shall be added to us then finally let's look at the evidence of God's love and first I want to talk about what is not the evidence of God's love here's where we get confused a lot circumstances are not the evidence of God's love people will look at their circumstances hey can I tell you something It rains on the just and the unjust. That's what the Bible says. We all go through hard times, whether we love Jesus or not. And we can't look at our circumstances, and if it's a bad day and there's things going wrong that are out of our control, we can't say, God must not love me. We can't do that. Our circumstances 
are not evidence of God's love. Listen to Romans 8, verses 35 through 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Listen, I don't want to go through any of that. But can I tell you something? There are people on this earth today, millions of people that are going through such hardships as that for no other reason except for they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord and they're born in the wrong country. But their circumstances, I, every Friday I get an email from Voice of the Martyrs and it was ICommitToPray.com. You should go there and sign up for emails on Friday. And every Friday I get three stories in my inbox of people that are being persecuted for their faith. And I pray over them and many other people pray over them. And you go online and you actually write a prayer in hopes that they may even be able to get online and see that prayer that's been prayed for them. But can I tell you something? They're going through some of the greatest hardships that probably none of us can even imagine. But they don't look at their circumstances as the evidence of the level of God's love for them. They know God loves them and they say, you know what? I'm just going to deal with it. I'm going to live with it. I'm going to suffer through it because God loves me. When you're going through a hard time, don't question God. Just rejoice that he loves you and he knows that you're going through a hard time. Circumstances are not evidence. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors, no matter your circumstances from day to day. Something else that's not evidence is your feelings. Your feelings is not the evidence of God's love. John 16, 22, Jesus is speaking to his disciples the night before he's nailed to the cross. He tells them what he's about, that he's about to suffer, he's about to bleed, he's about to die, he's about to be nailed to that tr cross, that he's going to have to go away. And they're suffering, they're mourning, they're in sorrow. Their feelings are getting the best of them. And here's what he says. He says, therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. Hey, listen, I don't know what you're going through in this life, but you keep trusting the Lord because this life is not the end. This life is a blip on the radar. This life is coming to a close. We're all headed downhill and we're all going to die. But one day we'll see Jesus again and those that belong to him will rejoice. Can I give you a visual of how small this life is? I, I mean, just perspective here. Imagine that I have a thread that goes from that wall to that wall. As a matter of fact, let's just imagine it goes through the wall and it goes unending both ways. And imagine right here on that thread is a button. That button is this life. That thread is eternity. That thread is what we get to spend with God. No matter what we go through, we don't have to look at our circumstances and say, Lord, why do you not love me? We don't have to um, f have our feelings and say, Lord, if I was, if I, why am I feeling this way? You must not love me. No, what we do when we're going through hard times and difficult times and, and sorrowful feelings and whatever it is, you just say, Lord, I know that this is hard, but I'm going to get through it because one day I spend eternity with you. And nothing is going to enter in there that's going to cause sorrow or grief or pain or dying. It's, it's all going to be a part of the past. The evidence of God's love. Here's the evidence of God's love. Jesus' sacrifice is the evidence of God's love. You know, it's in the death and resurrection of Jesus that God permanently convinced my heart that he loved me. Because it was through the death burial and resurrection of my Lord that one day I finally got a clue and I finally reached out to him and said, Lord, I need you to live in me. I want to give you my heart. I want you to cut away the flesh. I want you to get rid of all these guilty stains and I want you to come in and live in my heart and be the Lord and Savior of my life. And that would have never happened if he would have went, wouldn't have went to the cross. 
Because the Bible tells us that when he went to the cross, he took all my list of sins that I would commit, past, present, and future, and it says that he nailed it to his tree. He nailed it to the cross just like a convicted criminal would do. Back in that day when a criminal was either uh, put up in, in a jail cell or, or you know, hung on a cross or whatever it may be, they would literally, in a jail cell, they would write down why he was in jail and they would nail it to the door of his cell or in the dungeon or wherever he may be. And they would leave that there the whole time. People could walk by and see what he'd done and read the list. But here's the thing, when he finally paid his debt, They would take that list and they would write across it paid in full and they would stamp that thing and he would have to carry it with him always so that if anybody saw him in the future, they'd say, hey, there's that guy that robbed me. And you could say, no, I'm not that guy anymore. I've paid my debt. It's paid in full. But here's the thing about eternity. We don't have the ability to pay that debt in full. We're all sinners and we're all destined to die. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He took our list of sins. He nailed it to his tree. He paid the debt in our place. And so now we get to go free if we'll just accept him. If we'll just keep that promise close to us. And when people accuse us, when the devil accuses us, we just remind them of the promise of Jesus that he saved us. It's Jesus' sacrifice is the evidence. 1 John 3, 16, I'll read it again. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. You know, when you're looking at your feelings and when you're looking at your circumstances... Just look at the cross and realize that what he's done for you is he's given you an out. And one day, the circumstances are not going to weigh you down anymore. One day, the feelings are not going to be bad anymore. He says that in this life, we'll suffer. And you know what? That's why we come together like this as a body of believers. That's why we believe in church is because we come together. We get to know each other. We become friends. We try to encourage each other. We try to take care of each other. Listen, it's important to be a part of what the Bible says is the body of Christ. And that's why we come together week in and week out to encourage one another as this body, to help those that are suffering to be a blessing to those that are weak because tomorrow it may be me the death and resurrection of jesus christ to save us from the destructive nature of our sins is the final total and complete expression of god's love for us and now i want to invite you to respond to this message you know god's love gave everything god gave everything in just for just the hope that you might respond to him. For just the hope. And you say, well, how do you respond to God's love? Well, I want to share it with you. It's real simple. It's in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. It says this, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart... One believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And and that confession there can be in the form of a prayer. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. In other words, he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us, that's a promise in his word. It says, for there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord over all. That tells us it doesn't matter. Red, yellow, black, and white. All are precious in his sight. He has no distinction between one or the other. He loves everybody the same. And he offers everybody the same salvation. And so it simply says in verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now understand, he said, you've got to believe it in your heart and you've got to confess it with your mouth. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that right here and right now. And I want to pray a simple prayer 
of faith, believing in your heart. I want to just pray a prayer. There's no magic in these words. It doesn't have to be said just this way, but it may be that you're here today and you say, you know what, if I knew what to pray, I'd accept him today. I'd call on him today. Well, then I'm just going to pray a prayer out loud. And if it's the desire of your heart today, then I want you to pray it to yourself as I pray it out loud. Here's the prayer. Lord Jesus, today I realize your amazing love for me. Now I want to transfer my faith from myself and the things that I've been trusting to placing all my trust entirely in you. I want to receive your gift of eternal life. I'm willing to turn away from my sins and follow you. Jesus, I ask you to forgive all my sins and to be the Savior and Lord of my life. I give my life and my love to you. Amen. Now let me tell you something. If you prayed that prayer, the Bible tells us something very cool. It says that every time that someone receives Christ, there's great joy in heaven. The angels rejoice. If you prayed that prayer, they're rejoicing over you.